All right, we'll go ahead and get started. If you guys don't have a handout, I encourage you to grab one of those handouts uh, back in the back. This week we are studying chapter 25 of marriage. If you want to flip over in your confession to chapter 25, we'll be looking over that one this morning. And in this one, certainly a lot of good um, things to discuss and a, and a few things I think are also lacking um, from the confession that hopefully we'll, we'll be able to discuss as well um, in our time because certainly an important topic for us to cover. But let me go ahead and open in prayer and then we can just jump into chapter 25 of the 1689 Baptist Confession, the chapter on marriage. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to come this morning to gather and to worship you, to assemble as the saints in order um, to lift up your name, to hear from your word, um, and to receive the blessing of being in fellowship with one another and with you. And so, Lord, we're thankful for this day. God, I pray that you bless this time here in Sunday school. And even as we're um, nearing the end of this um, study through the confession, Lord, I just pray that this would be a fruitful time. It'd be beneficial. That it'd be edifying to us. Um, maybe help, help us have more clear categories and distinctions for some of the th things discussed. And Lord, particularly as we're discussing marriage, um, Lord, I pray that we would take very seriously what your word teaches on this union and the importance of this union and the purposes that you have um, for um, the covenant of marriage. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just um, be, be um, honored in this and we would apply things that we discussed this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So if you're looking at your handout for um, chapter 25 of the confession, there's three main um, sections in this part of the confession. Um, the first is the monogamous rule of marriage in paragraph one. Um, the second is the major purposes of marriage in paragraph two. And the third is the lawful parties of marriage in paragraphs three and four. And so we'll go ahead and, and go through the substance of what is in this chapter of the confession. And then at the back end of it, I want to go over some of the things that I think um, are lacking um, in this confession or not contained within it. Um, and it's my desire probably sometime within the next year for the, the elders of our church to write more thorough um, kind of treatment on our church's view on marriage, how we would handle things such as divorce, um, expectations in marriage, those sorts of things that just aren't within the confession. So I think everything within our confession is absolutely true and good. Um, but I do think in the contemporary moment that we're in, the year we're in, um, there needs um, more clarification that the, these um, four paragraphs provide. So that being said, I think it's a good um, chapter, but in the day in which we live, I think more clarity um, from the scripture is helpful because there's all kinds of confusion on this matter. But let's jump into paragraph one and see the monogamous rule of marriage. It opens by saying, marriage is to be between one man and one woman Neither is it lawful for any man to have more than one wife, nor for any woman to have more than one husband at the same time. All right, so this gets at the fact that God's created purpose for marriage is one man and one woman. Um, it is not a polygamous union. It is to be between one man and one wife. Now, we certainly see in the scriptures that many people did practice polygamy, particularly in the Old Testament. But that, that was not God, God's intent. That was not how he ordered it to be. And thus, as you get to the New Testament, Jesus is explicitly clear and going back to the created order with Adam and Eve that's supposed to be between one man and one woman. And then as you see the qualifications um, for officers within the church, this principle is reaffirmed, which re um, solidifies that that is God's intent. Why, why would God, God's polygamy is okay, but, but no church officer is allowed to do it. But everyone else can, but the, the church officers, they need to stay away from polygamy. Marriage is good, but not polygamy. That wouldn't be consistent, but rather for officers within the church, God makes it explicitly clear. They should be the husband of one wife, reaffirming that creation principle of one man and one woman, which Jesus also referred from throughout his teaching. So marriage is to be between one man and one woman. That is the norm or the rule of scripture um, and something that becomes not only clear in creation, but um, as God's progressive revelation goes on, he reaffirms with clarity that that is his intent for the union. Then again, to paragraph two, we're going to move right on because I don't think any of you are struggling with polygamy. If you are, 
Uh, we, got, we got our things to discuss in pastoral counseling. But um, if you're not struggling with that, let's go on to the major purposes of marriage, which certainly um, these are things that are practical for all of us that are married or will one day um, be married. And the kef- confession in this paragraph really lays out three uh, main purposes. And this is one of those things that I said, I think, if we were to write a like position paper sort of thing out of the elders, they'd want, want to flesh out some of these more. more. I think the principles laid out are true, uh, but they don't go into much detail. Um, and the three different things it lays out is the mutual help of husband and wife. The second is the increase of mankind with a legitimate issue or offspring would be another way to say that with legitimate offspring. And then third is the preventing of, of uncleanness. So it says marriage was ordained for the mutual help of a husband and wife for the increase of mankind with a legitimate issue and the preventing of uncleanness. So the first part of that is the mutual help of the husband and wife. You notice going back to the garden, what was it said um, to Adam that is not good that man should be alone? And what did God make fit for him from his rib? He made him a helpmate or a helper. And thus he needed um, the help of his bride. The bride was not merely some accessory or just because he was boredom, but a helpmate in the mission that God had given to him. He needed a helper. And so husband and wife depend upon each other. They need each other. They work together for the sake of the purposes God has for them. They are mutual helps. The particular emphasis was on the helpmate of the wife, but certainly the husband also helps his wife in his provision, um, protection, leadership over her, the different roles that God has given to him in order to be a help to his bride and his bride a help to him. So the mutual help of one another and the mission that God has called for them. Notice one of the things that God created in the garden for mankind is to be fruitful and multiply and fulfill the earth. Well, it's hard to do that as one single man, is it not? He needed help in that task of being fruitful and multiplying. That's not something he could have done of himself. So certainly we need one another. Um, and there's a beautiful picture of that if you read through 1 Corinthians 11 and the interplay between the two and the need of one another in that um, to study. And so the, the mutual help of a husband and a wife. And then the second is the increase of mankind with legitimate issue. One of the purposes of marriage is having babies. I don't know if you guys knew that. It's one of the greatest purposes of marriage is the having of babies. And thus, um, it's incredibly problematic and concerning when you have couples that want to come together and say, well, we want to be married, but we don't want to have any kids. That is not one of the purposes of marriage. Now, let's say um, two people are getting married and they're beyond child rearing years or something. That would certainly be acceptable. That's, there's no um, sin in that. But if a young couple able of having kids wanted to get married, but didn't want kids, they don't understand what marriage is. One of the purposes of marriage is for procreation. That's part of the mission that God has given to humanity and how he wants that mission to be carried out is through married couples. And thus it is incredibly important that man and woman as they come together in marriage are willing to to bear children, to have a godly offspring. That is what they are called to do. That's one of the purposes in marriage. But the purpose of marriage is not solely to have children. It's not as if it's just, just this cold union for, for the production of children. And, and the only purpose of coming together is just to make some offspring with nothing else for that. There's also, and gives a, a third purpose in this, the helpmate, the banking of children. And also it says um, the preventing of uncleanness, which another way of saying this would be to not engage in, in sexual sin. It's an outlet for these godly desires that God's given when within us, natural desires, things that God has created us for as it pertains to sex. But he's given us a particular lane in how those sexual expressions ought to take place. God really did give us hormones. He really did give us bodies that go through puberty. He really did create us for these sorts of things. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's good. That's how he designed our bodies to function. But he's given a particular outlet for those desires, and that is within the context of marriage. And that's why 1 Corinthians, again, cannot be more clear that if you're desiring these things, get married, right? Paul goes on to say it's good that he is single because some of the frontline mission work he was engaged in and constantly being thrown in prison and those sorts of things is not the most helpful way to have married life with children. Um, And he had the gift of celibacy, meaning he did not necessarily desire these things. 
But that is not normative for most people. Most people have natural desires to be in relationship with one another. And the outpouring of that desire is to get married. It's not a bad thing when uh, people desire those things. In fact, those are normal desires that God has placed within them. But it is to be pursued in marriage. This is one of the big problems with one of the things we're seeing in our culture right now is the marriage age continues to go up and up and up where it used to be very normal to get married you know right out of high school 18 19 20 early 20s where now the normative age for getting married is getting later and later later even well into the 30s it's no surprise that there's so much sexual sin going on in our culture god gave a natural output for those sexual desires and it was within marriage and you put off marriage and put off marriage and put off marriage it's not like those desires go away or those hormones that god has given you do nothing but they well up in people it's no surprise that there's so much um, sexual sin that occurs within society it's also no surprise that we have incredibly declining birth rates when we strip sex from the context of marriage and when we strip um, the marriage from the context of having children. Even in the simplicity of paragraph two, in one sense, there almost wish there's a lot more clarity to it. And I think in some ways there needs more clarity. Even right now in the contemporary moment, when you see the kind of sexual chaos that our society is in, if they would just wrap their head around paragraph <laughs> two of this chapter, a lot of those problems would be solved and not only wrap their head around it, but submit to it and see it as the good gift that it is from God. And so three purposes in this paragraph laid out for marriage, the mutual help of husband and wife, the increase of mankind with legitimate issue or offspring, and third, the preventing of uncleanness. Let's go into paragraphs three and four. It says the lawful parties of marriage. This happens by the general rule of liberty. It says it is lawful for all sorts of people to marry who are able with judgment to give their consent. In other words, it's saying, again, going back to this principle that the Apostle Paul laid out, that if you desire to get married, if you have these desires for a union, then you have freedom to do that. It's not wrong for people to get married to one another. And this is not even one of those blessings that are reserved for God's people. This is a common grace of God. Two unbelievers who desire to get married with to one another should absolutely get married. That's not a bad thing. It's something that God has given. They have the liberty to do that. Um, they have the freedom to do that. That is how God created us as humanity to function, is to order ourselves in marriages. Although that's certainly not true for every, every single individual. That's the normative truth for society. And we must understand that mankind has freedom in that. And even within the context of Christians, let's say you have a young Christian man and there's two women in the church he's going to, they're both suitable candidates and would very much be, you know, acceptable to marry and good moral and all those things, similar values. If he just likes one of them better than the other, that's okay. <laughs> he can pursue that one, right? He has liberty in that choice. If a woman has someone pursuing her who is godly, checks the right boxes, is, you know, an acceptable candidate within those bounds, and has absolutely no interest in the guy, she has liberty to not marry him, all right? There is liberty in marriage, in those things. It's certainly a good thing to be pursued, and, and we have to be wise in some of these things, but you are not bound um, towards marriage. Um, it is something that we do have liberty and judgment to give their consent in. And notice this is a confession going all the way back to the 1600s that stated these truths and the very much a time where arranged marriage was still very much part of it. And I don't think arranged marriage is all bad um, in every way. way. I think parents should help, help um, shepherd their children in these things in as much as they're able to. But the consent of both parties is still a good thing. Marrying off people to people they do not want to be married to is not a recipe for a healthy um, God-honoring marriage. Uh, but they should be willing participants in that, even if the parents are helping in their oversight and guidance of it, um, which I think parents ought, ought to do. But going on, it says the general rule of liberty and then the specific restrictions. And these are ones that hopefully we all know as Christians. It says, yet it is the duty of Christians to marry in the Lord. And therefore, such as profess the true religion should not marry with infidels or idolaters, neither should such as are godly be unequally yoked by marrying with such as are wicked in their life and maintain damnable heresy. 
It's just the, the clear teaching. Man, it's coming down. All right. But, um, those Christians are not to marry those who are not Christians. It's another very simple way of stating what the confession teaches at the end of paragraph three there. That's obviously a clear rule that as Christians, we are to marry in the Lord. And just because we have the liberty to choose our spouse doesn't mean we have the liberty to choose those who do not follow Christ as believers. We are to marry those who are of like faith with us. And why would you want to be unified in the most intimate human relationship with someone who doesn't share the most fundamental thing to you? That's a recipe for disaster. And I, and I, I just, just shared with you um, that my mother um, got, got saved um, after I did. I was already in a marriage and lived most for the rest of her life in a marriage with someone who was not seeking to follow the Lord. And that created a lot of heartache for her. This is a, a gracious rule that God is giving to his people. It's not a burden that he's laying on top of them. Like, guess what? I'm taking away the majority of your candidate pool. All right? That's not God's point in this. He wants us to be in unions that are honoring to him and a blessing to us. And it's not a blessing to you to be married to someone who doesn't agree on these things, to go week after week to church by yourself, to be trying to make big decisions with fundamentally different worldviews, to be trying to raise your children with fundamentally different values. That is not, not something that's going to lead to blessing in a marriage. And so I just see this restriction as really God's blessing upon his people, that he wants us to have fruitful, happy, joy-filled marriages. Um, he wants them to be marriages that are honoring to him. It's not a cold restriction. It really is a loving one for his people. And then getting into paragraph four, for anyone who did the homework last week, can someone help, help me out with what does consanguinity mean? Did anyone look up that word? That's one of the strangest words in the confession. Blood relatives, yeah. So this final paragraph in paragraph four, and this is where, <laughs> praise God, he brings the rain. And praise God that you came to Sunday school because you won't begin wet. All right? So there's many blessings this morning. But um, the final paragraph, and this one where it's, it's certainly true and, and, and good, and I think it, it helps flesh out some of the, the common law being applied um, or the law from the scripture being applied to all society and life in some good ways, where if we were going to write four paragraphs on marriage for the church in 2022, I don't think this is one of the paragraphs we would pick. It's good. It's true. I certainly affirm it. But, but there's other things in our contemporary moment that we would probably feel the necessity to add clarity on, which you just wonder what was all going on at the time that they felt this was really necessary to pen. Um, but what the final paragraph is getting at is that you should not marry your close relatives. Okay, that's, that's what it's getting at. It says marriage ought not to be within degrees of consanguinity or blood relation or affinity forbidden in the word. Nor can such incestuous marriages ever be made lawful by any law of man or consent of parties, so as those persons may live together as man and wife. And you get the, a great picture of this in the word in a bunch of different places. Leviticus 18 there is quoted from God's law, but then also in 1 Corinthians 5, in that kind of, kind of classic case of church discipline, it ha happens to do with this very thing, the man taking... Um, his mother as a wife, um, and he said, even the pagans don't do this, right? You're doing things that even the pagans wouldn't tolerate within the church. Um, and that's the sense here that paragraph four is not just restricted to Christians, but this is a general rule for all of society. No one should do this. Um, and, and certainly we know some of the science behind this and just the health problems that can come, but it's so much more than that. It's a moral issue. To be upheld. So these are the four paragraphs that has to do with marriage within our confession. The two things I wanted to get at, at kind of the tail end of this, where I think it's lacking um, and could use more robust treatment on, and like I said, at some point, I would like us as elders to write more, more of a robust um, position paper on some of these things. The first is that for some reason, and I've done a, a decent amount of research into this, and I have not found any good explanation as to why they did this. But as we were explaining kind of how this confession came together is, is really the combination of three main confessions. The first um, London Baptist Confession of Faith, the Westminster Con Confession of Faith, and, and then Savile Declaration, which was the Congregationalist revision 
of the Westminster Confession of Faith. And then they can bind those together and, and kind of tweak them to make what is the 1689. And both the Westminster Confession of Faith and then the Savoy Declaration of Faith, the, the Congregationist one, both use the same language around marriage, adding two more paragraphs than, than this has. And for some reason, the as they are putting together the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, they left those two paragraphs out and they pertain to divorce. And they're actually really helpful paragraphs. I don't know what they would have disagreed with in them. Um, some have argued that they took exception to some of the language, but there's not really any proof of that. Um, at least they'd be found in writings. And so I wanted to read those two paragraphs that are in the Westminster and Savoy Declaration that for some reason the authors did not include in this one, um, but they're pertaining to the issue of divorce. Um, and so if you were um, to look up chapter 22 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, this would be paragraphs five and six. The first four paragraphs are identical language to what we just read, but then they added two more um, pertaining to divorce. It says adultery or fornication committed after a contract being detected before marriage giveth just occasion to the innocent party to dissolve that contract. In the case of adultery after marriage, it is lawful for the innocent party to sue out a divorce, and after the divorce, to marry another as if the offending party were dead. All right, so that gives one context for a potential cause of divorce, and that is in cases of adultery, and it lays out specifically um, how that would play out and with the offended party and what, how to understand some of those things, and I think that's a clear teaching of scripture as a potential cause of divorce, although not necessitating divorce, um, but it does give, give an occasion for it um, under the law of God, I believe. And then in the paragraph six, it says, although the corruption of man be such as is apt to study arguments unduly to put asunder to whom God had joined together in marriage, yet nothing but adultery or such willful desertion as can be no way remedy by the church or civil magistrate is cause sufficient of dissolving of the bond of marriage, wherein a public and orderly course of proceeding is to be observed, and the persons concerned in it not left to their own wills and discretion in their own case. And so this really just lays out that we should not seek to tear apart that which God has joined together. It's a clear teaching of, of Christ. But there being really two causes that we see in the scripture of potential divorce, and that being adultery or willful desertion, particularly the case that you see in 1 Corinthians, as is one of the spouse came to Christ, the other spouse is not a member of Christ, and then the unbelieving spouse leaves the believing spouse or deserts them. And, he's, and Paul says, you're not bound, okay? So that's something that seems kind of foreign to us. We, you probably haven't heard many examples of where someone comes to Christ and then their unbelieving spouse like walks out the door never to be seen again. But in other cultures and customs, that's actually was very common, particularly even now um, in religions such as like Muslim faiths, if someone becomes a believer, it's not odd at all for family to completely shun, cut, cut that person off. So let's say you're, you're a wife who just came to Christ and now your husband leaves you high and dry. You have no way of providing for yourself and your entire extended family cuts you off. He's saying like in those types of circumstances, you're not wrong if you were to then remarry a, a Christian or something in that example in order to be provided for and cared for, you did what you could, um, but you were utterly cut off. And so I think it, it, those two paragraphs help give clarity to the divorce should never just automatically be pursued. It's always the last resort. We should not seek um, to put asunder what God has joined together, it says in, in paragraph six there. But there does seem in the scriptures to be a couple examples given um, for legitimate cases of it to be, and one of the things I really like about it, even at the end, the end of paragraph six there, is, there, is it talk about uh, these are not things that you should be doing based on your own discretion, uh, but actually things that should go through matters such as the courts and your pastors to help think through and discern these matters. Um, I have seen um, happen multiple times um, where in cases of adultery, you have a, a repentant member of the marriage who did commit act of adultery, but was willing to seek, seek reconciliation. And the offended party views it as like, this is my get out of jail free card. 
and just runs off in ways that really I don't believe are honoring to the Lord. And so I, I don't think those exceptions are just these like blanket statements of like, no matter what, if this happens, you're done, you're free. I don't think that's the picture they paint, but rather of extreme cases there being um, with wisdom and prudence and studying the scriptures, there can be legitimate causes of divorce. So I think we should never we should never gladly run from the marriage covenant ever in any circumstance. It should always be a grievous thing, something that's sought with a lot of counsel, a lot of prayer, a lot of input, a lot of studying of the scriptures. Reconciliation is a beautiful picture. It's a very gospel centered um, picture. When, whenever that's possible, it should be pursued. Um, so I, I don't, in, in including or saying those paragraphs and saying I think they have some helpful insight here, I don't want you to hear me saying, you know, any sort of flippant view towards getting out of a marriage covenant. I don't think that should ever be pursued. But there's some, um, even men that I would really respect, that would argue that there is absolutely never any cause for divorce biblically ever, and absolutely never any justification for remarriage ever. And I just think that's a hard position to back up in the scriptures. I, I think that is certainly the standard that God wants to keep together. That's what he's joined. That should be the norm and the overwhelming majority. Um, but to be definitive that 100% of the time, it's always wrong to divorce. I, I just think it's a hard position to back up biblically because there seems to be clear examples um, to, to the contrary of that. So with that being said, I think some more discussion on divorce would be helpful in this. And then as well, I think it's lacking um, in fleshing out paragraph two what some of those roles, duties, responsibilities within um, marriage are. There's a lot of teaching in scripture on these matters. And so to be very general, um, I think could be more specific in some of those things. So that being said, Holy Affirm, chapter 25. I think it's a, a great chapter. It gets into a lot of even clarifying errors that we see in our own day. But I do think there would be some aid for us to have, as a church, maybe a more robust document, position paper of these are some of the things we believe on marriage. And even, even particularly just as a guard against, against ourself, as pe people come and say, we want to use your building for our homosexual wedding or, or whatever. I think it'd be helpful for us to actually have a document going, no, this is actually what we think about X, Y, and Z. Um, and so we will not do it based on this position we have declared in that. So that being said, that is chapter 25. Um, do you guys have any questions on this or um, clarifications that you'd, you'd like? Or? Yes. Well, and I, this might be an ignorant question, but yeah. if, if I was thinking about what you were saying, the London Baptist Confession is a combination of the Westminster. Yes. Then the Savoy Declaration. The Savoy Declaration. Right. And that was saying that you can be congregational and that the congregation. Right. I, I was just curious where in scripture we got that model. Because I, like, no. a Presbyterian, coming from a Presbyterian right. church, we can go back to Acts 15, we're talking about the Jerusalem Council. Right. You have this issue of circumcision. You know, is, do we have to keep that part of the law? And they leave and they go to right. the elders and the apostles. Yeah and ask them, like, guys, what do you think about this? Right. And so I was just kind of curious why, um, why from, you add that in. From, from the an congregational perspective. perspective, yeah. yeah. Um, I think particularly in the establishment of local churches and those being a very specific government that is laid out, whereas some of the more associational governments are maybe referenced but not as specifically um, detailed. We will get into that more next week, so I don't want to completely just punt on your question, um, but next week is of the church and it, and it gets into some of that. Um, so so I, I think that's a big part of it. And then as well, just understanding the role of membership within a local church, I think is a lot of what was behind the Congregationalist and the Baptist um, movement of things even like the congregation being responsible for acts of church discipline and some of those matters in the scriptures and trying to build an understanding of congregational responsibility while still affirming things like elder rule and, and trying to, to marry some of those different principles in the scripture was a lot of what was behind that. Yeah. But I do think there is unmistakably in the scriptures this idea of, you know, whereas presbytery or association or this idea of other churches that have some sort of accountability and responsibility with one another, um, there is a principle of that to where um, um, even believing in the autonomy of the local church um, in, in a lot of ways, I don't think just freewheeling it completely on your own without any 
um, sort of relation with other churches um, or accountability with our churches is a mistake that sometimes I think Baptists fall into where they just really are kind of an island amongst Christendom with, with no form of accountability and that can lead to problems. Being part of groups leads to the problems too sometimes. <laughs> it can go both ways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think really it'd just be a, like a position paper that the elders would, would write and present to the church and by some, something that di- different like, like the statement of faith or like, like our constitution by laws. But saying, and, and this is what we've, we've put together is this something the congregation affirms and, and vote on something like that at, at a member's meeting. And there's a number of things where I think those types of position papers are helpful um, because they're, it's unlike a confession that once you kind of plant your flag on it's really not changing. You, you can address some more contemporary issues of things going on and say, this is where we stand as a church um, on particular issues that you think need biblical clarity in the day you're in. Yeah. Question, just for the youngers to help sure. them out. Um, so, you were talking about polygamy not being necessarily something that God um, would have affirmed. Obviously, we see foundationally early on right. there would have been relationships that would have been tighter bloodline right. all the way through the flood. How how do you delineate in the sense of which is in the sense of as as uh, as they were husband and wife were integrated and that line became more clearly, how, how would you differentiate that? It ain't yeah. not inherently planned or good. Yeah, that's a good question. So particularly on, on the polygamy point, I think it's something that was, we can see the intent in the garden as being a monogamous marriage, um, but that they quickly departed from that intent and that God, as with, with all his revelation progressively clarified it as time went on. He definitely, um, I think, put up with it or was gracious and long-suffering with the practice. It's not something that he felt the need to, to squash immediately. Um, but as time went on, I think he did clarify in scriptures related to the relational part of that um, coming out of, of the garden, some like the genetic understanding of relatives and stuff. I think it's pretty clear that they were marrying and engaging in marriage with immediate relatives. God created the whole world from two men. Um, There's all kinds of creation science sort of arguments behind how you can understand that in a way that's not um, creating the problems of like interfamily relationship and children um, with regard to the purity of the gene pool at that time. I think some of those arguments are interesting. I I don't totally, um, I'm not an expert in them. I think it's a better way for me to say that. But it, there is interesting arguments along those lines, but I think it's just clear that, again, as God's work in creation continued to go out, there's things that he clarified um, for the people, and we see those original intents in the garden, um, but that doesn't mean that he can't bring greater clarity as time goes on. So. Does that kind of answer your question? I, I wish I was a better expert on some of the genetic pooling of Adam's offspring, but... It was more just a clarification yeah. of the right. polygamy and the relational of just right. giving some more context. Right. I do think there, there is some things that go, that go on with, with polygamy and as, as part of God's progressive unrolling of things. When you think about society and the time that that was happening, um, polygamy often was a form of protection for some of these other women that didn't have maybe other options as a way to bring them under the house, give them um, covering, give them protection, um, give them provision, those sorts of things. I think some of those things were happening in society that again, were not ideal and God did um, abolish them um, very clearly, um, but lead to an understanding of why those sorts of practices were happening. Um, in the day in which they lived, men were dying off at a much higher rate than women. And so you got all these women, what do you do with them? Um, in a society like that, well, they took more of them as wives, you know, that, that was the solution they came up that wasn't a, a good solution necessarily, but it's what happened because um, a lot of men were dying off doing very dangerous things for provision. So. Yeah.
What? Well, it's a fair question. Let me pray, and we'll wrap this up. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, for allowing us again to gather and worship. We, we thank you for that, that uh, quick rainstorm we have. Um, and Lord, pray that that would help um, water our land. We thank you for your provision in that. And Lord, I just pray as we continue on this morning that we'd be going and running to your word and seeing Christ in all of the scriptures. And Lord, I just pray um, that as we even sing um, here shortly and, and worship together um, and join our voices in praise to you, that we'd do so um, not in such a way as we, we go through the motions, but Lord, I pray that you'd help us to really engage um, our faith in the things we're doing this morning and do them with joy and gladness, knowing what you've done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.